Hello, my friends. Our topic is the moon. What does the moon actually do in astrology? I've talked about the meanings of the planets in vibrational astrology before, and I'm going to go into what the moon does in much greater detail to explore exactly how it works and how it works when the moon combines with other planets. And this is really important because the planets are the most fundamental things. A lot of times we think the zodiac signs are the most fundamental things because that's what everybody talks about. I am an Aries, I am a Taurus. But what does it mean when somebody says, I am an Aries? It means the sun was in a section of the sky called Aries. So we have planets, we also have abstract mathematical points. The ascendant and the midheaven are abstract math mathematical points. Where the ascendant is in the sky is your rising sign. So here's a key point that I have in bold. You can have astrology without zodiac signs. There are forms of astrology that do not have zodiac signs. But you cannot have astrology without referring to celestial objects or abstract mathematical points in the sky. So in that sense, the planets are the most fundamental. And so I want to really look carefully at how we think about the planets. So let's take, for example, Saturn, just randomly picking Saturn. What does it do? So I've got some images on the screen that convey what Saturn means according to most astrologers. Saturn has certain qualities, things that you experience in life. It has to do with getting older. When a person gets older, they might become more rigid in their movements. They might become physically thin, thinner. They might become wiser, less jovial. Those kinds of characteristics that we associate with aging are Saturn. So we have an image of this wise guy going through this, probably an ancient book. It's like we call it archetypal. There's some combination of qualities that come together. And that combination of qualities that come together is the archetype. So this wise guy going through this ancient book, this fellow here, different kind of wisdom or understanding, this old tree, a desert, the barrenness, the, the lack of any kind of excitement, no festivities, the simplicity, and then the grim reaper. To an astrologer, these are all different sides to an archetype. So the way as most astrologers think is they're feeling this archetype. It's like this little world that emanates these qualities. And these five images, including this very old tree with probably very few or no leaves on it, all part of the Saturn archetype. So when you think astrologically, you're thinking in terms of these images that come together, they hold together, and we call it an archetype. I'll do just one more planet. I just want to get this idea across. Mars. So I've got two images here. The soldier and someone that looks like an athlete. To an astrologer, these are manifestations of, of the archetype of Mars. The archetype of Mars has to do with action, being muscular, being aggressive. All of these qualities can take form in different ways. So it's this kind of elusive mental construct that exists. It's something that exists out there. And the planet expresses or embodies or synchronistically, somehow you might say magically, happens to correspond to these qualities in life. This is how astrology is normally understood. Now, I hope you've kind of like absorbed that. It's like a meditation. You can just like feel that. Now, <laughs> wipe it away. Take an eraser and just wipe it away. Because in vibrational astrology, 
we have a radically different view of how the planets function. They are not archetypes. That's a beautiful way to think. You can go into this, like, you know, real deep feeling about all these different archetypes. It's beautiful. Archetypes are important. They're real. They're fundamental. It does not mean that astrology works that way. So we have a radically different idea in vibrational astrology. What we're proposing is that, yes, there are these archetypes. They're very important. But Saturn is not actually that archetype. Saturn's this bunch of gas that goes around the planet and, you know, Mars and everything. They're like, you know, rocks and, you know, gas or whatever they are going around the sun. And they are not reflecting these archetypal stories. The archetypes are like a symptom of something else. What the planets are doing as they go around the sun is they're regulating some process, an energetic process. And I've listed here on the screen what that energetic process is. If we jump down to Saturn, Saturn's not this archetype of a you know being older and wiser and and less jovial. Saturn is a process of stripping away what is superfluous. You can imagine in life, if we never strip away what is superfluous, we just end up with all this stuff we don't need. Saturn is like a knife that goes in and says, oh, I don't need that, I don't need that. Saturn decides what's really important. Now, maybe that's just as crazy and bizarre that some bunch of dirt or rocks or gas going around the sun can regulate a process, but that's what the planets do. Uh, and Mars, what is Mars? Is it this archetype of energy and aggression? No, Mars is this force to accomplish something, to get something done. That we as human beings have this feeling that if we apply ourselves, we get something done, you know, we studied for the exam, we went grocery shopping, we, whatever we did, we get this feeling of satisfaction that, ah, I accomplished that. That whole energetic process is being regulated by Mars. That's the idea. And I want to talk specifically about the moon. Let me review quickly all of them. The sun regulates the present moment. Now, this is interesting. The sun and moon regulate time. The other planets regulate some more specific function. And I'm going to talk about how the moon reflects the past into the present. And I'm going to talk about when the moon makes an aspect to the sun. It has a certain meaning. How does that meaning, how does that impact of the planets reflect or express the fundamental processes involved? So what I'm going to do in this video is give you a better understanding of the theoretical framework underlying the interpretations. The main thing in vibrational astrology is it's evidence-based. We do research. We go through databases. We see what these things are doing. Vibrational astrology does not grow from theory, it grows from observation. But the theory helps tremendously because it helps us know what to look for. It also helps us in consultations to understand what's going on. So it makes sense of the observations. But we do not derive the meanings from some preset intuitive idea of what the things do. We develop an understanding of the functions from the observations. Observations are the primary thing. Okay, so Mercury, it makes mental associations and connections. Venus is attraction to beauty. So when you see something beautiful, you're drawn to it. That process of being drawn to something beautiful, that's the process of Venus. Jupiter simply expands. That's all it does. Uranus resonates with the instant. It puts us in resonance. It puts us in attunement with whatever vibrations are happening at the moment. Neptune is an attraction to an ideal, and specifically a practical, glorious possibility. 
and Pluto, Pluto is compulsive desire from deeply ingrained patterns and experiences. I talk more about these in other videos, but I want to dive into the moon in this video to really understand it in more detail. So, what does the moon do? Reflects the past into the present. How do we experience the past? How do you and I experience the past? Well, the most obvious thing is memory. We remember. We remember what happened yesterday. We remember what happened when we were kids. You know, we try to memorize things that we need to learn. Memory is a process of the moon. If the function of the moon did not exist, we would not have any memory at all. We would just be experiencing things and they would just come and go. People who focus on the past, people who study history, that is a function of the moon. Now, very often in astrology, we think of the moon as emotional, as warm. Some people say it's maternal. Studying history, which doesn't seem so warm and emotional, moon is considered to be an emotional planet. Could that be related to the moon? Yes. So we have some different ideas. The moon is not necessarily emotional. The moon is a process of reflecting the past into the present. Memory, going back to see what happened in the past. History, for example. Anthropology. Depth psychology. When a psychologist says, oh, you know, this happened in your childhood. They're going back to see what was going on in the past. Here's another thing. The moon is not only reflected into the present through our parts of our brain, right? Parts of our brain enable us to memorize things. So what's interesting is there's a part of our bodies that's engaged in the process. So parts of your brain are involved in memory. The third thing I have here on the slide is moods, disposition, and attitude. So somebody who's, you know, depressed, there's an accumulation of experiences that get registered emotionally and create your disposition. So the accumulation of all those experiences affects your mood, your disposition, your overall attitude. So past experiences we can access them mentally as memories. They're also impacting us by our moods, disposition, and attitude. Also related to this is you could have tension in your body from trauma that's being re repressed or being dealt with or anxieties. All these things affect you physically. Now, this gets really interesting. The past is the foundation of everything. Genetics, what you've inherited, is related to the moon. Everything about your body is affected by what you've been eating, what you've been doing, have you been exercising, have you been anxious, have you been nervous? They're affecting your body. All of these past things are affecting us. So the moon is such an enormous, vast principle because the past is affecting everything. So number six, point number six, everything we see was built up over time. Without memory, there's no sustained thought. If there's no memory, you're just seeing things and forgetting them. It's interesting that in Vedic astrology, the moon rules the mind. You know, like you take Introduction of Vedic Astrology, and they say moon rules the mind. And if you're Western astrology, you go, what the heck? <laughs> no, Mercury is the mind. But you can see how it makes sense that the moon rules the mind. No memory, no mind. No, no ability to put things together. Everything just comes and it's gone. So that's what the moon is doing. Uh, if there was only the function of the sun, 
which regulates the present, and we didn't have the function of the moon, we would see and hear things, and we could respond, but then we would forget what has happened. It's similar to what you see with a baby, when the baby you know, responds and then it seems to forget very quickly. Uh, people with dementia, and probably the best example is amnesia. We would all have like 100% amnesia if the m function of the moon didn't exist. So that's what the moon does. Now, I put up those six things on this slide, and I'm presenting in bold the planets related to it. What planets are related to moon to memory? Moon, Mercury. So when the moon aspects Mercury, if you have moon trine Mercury, or you have moon square Mercury, or moon conjunct Mercury in your birth chart, that's what it means. You don't have to go through a bunch of archetypes and images and possibilities. It means Mercury, which is connecting and associating ideas. What is it associating ideas? It's associating ideas from the past. It's very simple. So associating and connecting ideas from the past. Oh, that when you say, oh, that reminds me of, you know, you remind me of this person or this reminds me of that. You make these associations based on what you've seen before. That's Moon and Mercury. People with Moon and Mercury are devoting a lot of their energy to memory. That's what it does. And when you focus on the actual energy process, it's always true. That's the cool thing. You'll see that the person's involved in it. And I'm going to talk in more detail about each one of these planetary pairs, what Moon Mercury means. And it works through certain parts of your body. The moon Mercury works through parts of the brain and neurotransmitters that connect, you know, between the, the different nerves. Um, they don't send messages between one nerve and another one. Um, so number two, history, anthropology, and depth psychology. I mentioned history. This is often sun, moon. So if you have an aspect of sun and moon in your birth chart, you're born at new moon or full moon or something like that, what does it mean? Like people will say, oh, well, the sun is the archetype of, you know, this, and the moon is the archetype of the mother and the home, and, and they mix all these archetypes together. That works a little bit, but what gets to the heart of it is just to realize that what the person is doing is they're seeing how the past is embedded in everything you're seeing around you. I'll talk more about this. We're going to go through each planetary pair, um, but I'm just introducing it now to give you an idea. Um, what about moods, disposition, and attitude? I just mentioned that on the previous slide. Moods, disposition, and attitude. Most planetary pairs are affecting mood, disposition, and attitude. If you have moon aspected to Mars in your chart, it means the past is reflected into the present as your mood, and your mood is competitive. You're enjoying, you like the atmosphere of doing. You like it when you're on a, a team or you're on a, uh, you're part of a business and you have a team that's trying to develop something or market something, getting something done. You're on a, a workforce. You're, maybe you're building houses and you have a team. One person is doing the plumbing, the other is doing the electric. All these different people enjoying the process of getting things done. That feeling of working. People with Moon Mars like to put out energy and see something happen. This is what it means to have Moon Mars. It means if you're not feeling like you're accomplishing something, you're in a bad mood. The mood, the moon is reflecting into the present the feeling of getting things done. Moon Mars people are doers. Now you might say, why are they doing if moon is the mood? Because this is the 
atmosphere they like. They feel happy when there's a competition. If there's a sporting event, they're rooting for one side. They want to see one side accomplish, get more points. It's a form of Mars, achievement, getting it done. Oh, we won the game. You know, we got, we won three to one, or we lost, whatever. Moon Mars, that excitement of the competition, the sweat, the engagement, the putting yourself out there. It's enjoyable to Moon Mars. You might say, well, why would people enjoy all this pain and whatever? Because it's the joy of accomplishment. So Moon Mars means you, this is the mood, the atmosphere, the attitude that you feel good with. And what part of the body does it work through? It works, it can work through muscles, but you might be achieving something purely mental. Maybe you're studying to be, you know, that takes a lot of effort, like becoming a doctor. And you're studying and you're achieving and you're moving, doesn't require physical muscles. It always affects your hormonal system. So different parts of the body get engaged to do that. And Moon Jupiter, we say in vibrational astrology that Moon and Jupiter make you open and welcoming. Well, if Jupiter's expansion and Moon is the past, how the heck does the past and expansion make you open and welcoming? It seems like a big jump, but it's not a big jump. What's happening is the mood, the feeling, instead of being Mars, go, 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 get stuff done, it's I enjoy opening up. I feel good when I'm exposed to new things. I'm in a good mood. My moon is Jupiterian. It's liking to explore, to be open. This is the mood, the feeling, the attitude. And it make, what happens with moon Jupiter is they're welcoming. They love meeting people who are different from themselves. They love meeting people with different lifestyles, different cultural backgrounds. It's fun. Like, oh my God, this is so cool. I, you know, what kind of art, what kind of music, what kind of dance, what kind of everything. There's so much to open up to. They don't want to be doing the same old thing over and over. Jupiter detests repetition. It wants to explore, it wants to expand. So Moon Jupiter means open. Are they going to be, you know, travel around the world and stuff like that? No, the Moon is just the mood. The Moon is not doing anything. It's just reflecting the past through your disposition. So Moon Mercury works through parts of the brain more. Moon Mars, Moon Jupiter are working through your disposition, your moods. So it becomes welcoming. Moon Saturn also works through your moods. The feeling of get down to basics. Remove everything that seems superfluous. Moon Saturn inclines to a solitary disposition, a serious attitude, wanting to know what you're really saying, not able to just be silly for no, you know, just just to be silly. They want to know what the point of everything is. So Moon Saturn is a, is a, um, a critical disposition, seeing what's important. They like to pull away from life, to be alone, because, because when you're engaged all the time, you can't really evaluate and think about what's really important. So Moon Saturn becomes a, you might say, a serious disposition. And Moon Neptune is interesting. Neptune is the desire for uh, for something that makes you feel elevated that makes you feel lifted up in a practical sense. A lot of people think Neptune is all about 
angels and psychic and stuff like that. Usually it's not. It can be in certain situations. But typically Moon Neptune, um, a Neptune, sorry, is about things like if I win the lottery, I'll be in heaven. If I can go to this concert and see my favorite uh, music group, I will be in heaven. It's this feeling of what makes you feel like intoxicated, what makes you feel really lifted up, not in some abstract way, but really inspired, really wonderful. And what happens with Moon, again, it's the disposition of feeling wonderful. So Moon Neptune people really dislike arguments. They dislike fighting. You might say, well, who likes fighting? Well, we do it all the time. Um, you know, we, we, people argue with each other all the time. Moon Neptune has trouble with that. They just have difficulty arguing. They have difficulty being confronted because the moon is where you feel comfortable. It's the accumulation of a lot of past experience setting the mood. Moon Neptune does not want friction. It wants to remove all friction so they can be in the mood of being inspired, elevated. They're often putting flowers in the house. You know, they often like candles. They, they like soft lighting, the ambiance, the mood. They want it to be uplifting. They have a little garden. It's not necessarily some big spiritual thing. It can seem rather subtle, but they're making things pleasant. They often have specific tastes. You know, it doesn't have to be expensive or fancy or very artistic, but they just feel good with a certain tablecloth on the table. Like little trivial things um, are important to Moon Neptune. They want to be in the mood, a certain feeling of being, a feeling like not inspired in some wild way, but to feel like life is worth living. There's something beautiful happening. This is what Moon Neptune is about. So these energy processes come together. It's very difficult to predict how they combine together and what they will do, but this is what we've observed happening. At the bottom, I mentioned Moon Uranus um, is a lively disposition. So the mood, again, it works through the moods, is lively, spontaneous. They like little thrills and surprises. They also like awakening the past um, and giving it new enthusiasm. They often have a love of certain older styles of art. They go, oh my God, I love this Victorian furniture. Oh, I love it so much. It's so wonderful. People who get all excited about Victorian furniture, like you're, you're that excited about it? Oh yeah like wildly excited. They, they revive, they reawaken the soul, the soul that most people think is dead and gone, it's not part of whatever fashions are happening. Moon Uranus has a love of fashions that other people thought were dead. And they have a, a they like surprises and spontaneity. They often like humor, things like this. And Moon Pluto is compulsive or obsessive feelings. So Moon Pluto likes to vent, to take things that are deep inside and have them come out. Often it's through music or movies and drama, some way to find out what's percolating underneath and get it out of your system. So this is what the planetary pairs mean. And what I'm doing in this video is I'm showing how the basic principles of what each planet means in vibrational astrology come together to make the meanings of the pairs. Um, I'm teaching some classes and some of my students say, I don't understand why Moon Mars is competitive. Like, how does that relate to the energy process? So I decided I'm going to make this 
video specifically about the moon. I can do other planets, um, other combinations about how the fundamental energy process of two planets comes together to create a certain effect. And there's no easy way to foresee that. Um, yeah, it's like it's like a recipe or mixing notes together. You mix them together and then then you see what actually happens. I'm at a half hour. Um, I probably got another 15 or 20 minutes. I'm going to stop here and then I'm going to go through each planetary pair. Sun, Moon, uh, Moon, Mercury, Moon, Venus. I've already told you what they mean. I'm just going to talk about it a little bit more, go over it to make sure you've got it. Because in vibrational astrology, what we believe is that when you understand these processes and how they come together, like what happens when sun and moon gets together, and you understand what's actually happening, oh my God. It's like you just, bam, you just see what's actually happening and you're not fiddling around with all these archetypal images that may or may not be true. You just get right into the heart of what energetic process is trying to work through the person. And then the archetypes are born out of this. They're very important. But astrology is not an archetypal language. That's, that's you know, I don't know that absolutely, but that's our model. That's our theoretical framework that's working very well in our research, um, reveals all kinds of things very clearly, and that's that's the theory that we're working with. And getting yourself to move out of thinking archetypally, seeing the archetypes as secondary, they're just symptoms, and thinking about the planets in terms of this energetic force, this motivation, this need that's coming from what we call a higher dimensional space, you can think of it as like a spiritual purpose, that this is what you're supposed to be doing. It takes some time. Like with my students, they'll always go back to what they're familiar with. So if you can get yourself to think this way, I think what you'll find if you're a practicing astrologer, once you start thinking this way, you can just pinpoint and target things much more directly, much more effectively, and make much more sense more consistently with your clients. Okay, I'm going to do a part two and just go over each planetary pair, sun, moon, moon, mercury, da, 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 with like nine pairs, I think. We'll just go over those in a little more detail. And as you can see here on this slide, give some examples. Like if you have sun, moon, you're born at new moon, you're born at full moon, you have sun, moon, square, what exactly are you likely to do when the moon reflecting the past into the present and the sun shining light on the present? Let's, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about how, what happens. How, how does that develop and what goes on? So we'll do that in a part two. Okay, thank you very much for listening, my friends. God bless. Namaste.